Hi, I'm Tim, he's Jack, welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. This is Icons of Time. In the 1990s, the nascent independent horology movement sprung up amid a landscape that was still dominated by legacy brands. Jack, I was in college at the time, so fill me in. What did the watch landscape look like, and out of what did Debitoon grow? Oh boy. Um, by the way, Tim, but before we go any further, since we're going to be talking about design, I want to compliment you on your socks. Thank you very a, much. Um, a, a certain gentleman of style once said to me, you should never be funnier than your socks. And uh, I think you've, you've got something going here. Well, um, as stylized as they are, I wore that because that's Debitune Blue, which will feature prominently yes, 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 later yes. in the episode. You brought that one home. Yeah, it was... Um, it was a very, very interesting time. I mean, it would be hard to pick uh, a year out of the last 25 years in watchmaking that wasn't interesting in one way or another. Because post-quartz post crisis, what basically happened was mechanical watches became gradually decoupled from their primary role as precision timekeepers. And we started to see an expression of watches and watchmaking as an art form and as an expression of philosophy of time. Maybe to an extent that we hadn't seen since precision timekeeping really became possible. So, you know, you go back to 1800, say, when Breguet is, uh, uh, you know, making his bones in Paris. And um, that really was when we started to see the possibility for true precision timekeeping in pocket watches. And, and actually, um, from a design standpoint, that's when watchmaking started to become a little bit boring because, you know, the emphasis was so much on precision and was so much on actual actual accuracy as a measure of how good a watch was, that um, you, know, you, you, start, you stopped seeing um, you know, uh, a lot of the sort of crazy decorative stuff, uh, the crazy mechanical stuff that you saw in the 1500s and 1600s, and even a lot of the 1700s. And um, that happened again uh, post-Quartz crisis. So by the time David Thune came along, you know, we already had an association of independent watchmakers. We had already seen um, things like the Ulysses Nardin Freak, you know, appeared, which kind of, uh, it wasn't the very first watch of the sort of hyper watch era, not hype watch, but hyper watch era, but it was certainly well, one of the most memorable. So I think that when Debethun launched, uh, you know, and at that point, uh, Denis Flagelet was already, you know, a very, very experienced watchmaker, an exp expert in complications, very much a guy with his own ideas about how things should be done. There was a sense in the air that really anything was possible and that everything should be tried. You know, and in that climate, the early Debethun watches, um, you know, DB1 through 5, you know, certainly, you know, those were relatively restrained watches given the, given the sort of climate. And uh, they're, they're beautiful pieces and they're technically really interesting. You know, DB1, their very first watch, Monopusha chronograph with a THA movement. It's a fantastic, fantastic watch, but relatively conservative compared to, I think, what uh, Debethun already had in mind and um, relative to what they would introduce just a few years later. Without a doubt, in the 1990s and the 1980s, as mechanical watchmaking recovered, a lot of these legacy brands were seen as vehicles for their own history and heritage, and that was the selling point. As we moved through the 90s into the 2000s, I think everyone was inspired by kind of the face-melting amount of heat surrounding Franck Muller at the time. Sure. And a lot of these brands became vehicles for individuals, these new brands, rather than ancient heritage that may or may not be relevant. So David Zanetta and Denis Flagelet create Debatoon in 2002. Uh, talk a little bit about what each brought to the brand. Well, I mean, um, I think Denis really brought the, brought the watchmaking heat, obviously, um, brought the expertise and complications. David Zanetta obviously brought um, his own perspective on you know, watch collecting as well and on what he wanted from a design standpoint. Um, there was a sense through him of a relationship with uh, automotive styling and automotive engineering as well. And um, the two of them together, I think, were necessary to create Debethun, both from a sort of economic standpoint and from a design standpoint. I think David Zanetta probably doesn't get quite as much credit as he should for um, influencing the direction that Debethun took in the early days. And that is important. You talk about David Zanetta not getting enough credit for what he brought to the brand as a co-founder, original principal. He came in and he performed most of the 
uh, aesthetic guidance. He was a vintage dealer, he was a vintage expert and collector. He brought in the design of old travel clocks, pendant watches, pocket watches, and from a lot of those inspirations, we got those DB1 series watches in the conventional round cases with solid dials, with Roman numerals, with Breguet hands, uh, with guilloche, silver dials, very, yeah, yeah. very classical. Maybe not identical to anything that had come before, but very deeply rooted in the past. And he continued to influence the design progression through 2017 when he eventually bowed out. He was over 70 at that point, he was done. Yeah. But his design influence is probably the number one reason why each generation of Debitune watch looks almost nothing like the last. And I think once we get to the DB20s and the DBSs in 2004, 5, and 6, we start to see the evolution of the shape. And a lot of brands like Franck Muller and FP Journ, they key in on one iconic shape and they stick with it. De Batoon was willing to blow things up after just three or four years. Yeah, I mean, there. I think each one of the case designs that De Batoon has has become kind of iconic for the brand because nobody else has ever nobody else has tried to uh, emulate them to any extent. But you're right. The uh, the tendency for independent watchmakers has been by and large to pick a single design language and more or less stick with it. So we have um, we have kind of have to me the two interesting opposing poles in that respect are uh, Francois Paul Journ and Dave Bethune, because with Dave Bethune, as you say, we see an evolution from one generation to the next, really, really dramatic evolution in some cases, where the later watches, in, in, like in retrospect, you could see a connection with the earlier pieces, for sure, um, but it's more of a general sensibility rather than a specific design language. But, you know, Francois Pogerin essentially has one case, really. I yes. mean, they're, they're, they're very, very traditional round watches, and he's not particularly interested in, I wouldn't say that he's immune to the charms of design or disinterested in design because he's made very, very specific design decisions in the dials of his watches and in the cases and in, in the movements. But it's not the same kind of wild efflorescence of, um, you know, kind of out there new ideas that you see on a, on a regular basis at Dave Bethune, which you still see on a regular basis at Dave Bethune. And so we had that DB1 series through roughly DB20 when we had regular round cases, solid dials, ogival lugs, and then with the DBS that came after and the DB20 series, the DBS, it was almost like Baroque classical, because now we had the yeah. escapement and the balance on the dial. We had visible barrel bridges on the dial side. We still had that vintage inspiration. It was almost like a pendant watch and a pocket watch all in one. You had a conventional wristwatch style lug, but then you also had hinge lugs on the DBS. So that was kind of their first foray into the avant-garde. And then with the DB20, I don't know how to describe it, maybe a giant sporting shingle? <laughs> That's the first thing yeah. that comes to mind. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, I to, to, to me, the single most disruptive moment in the ent entire design history of Debatoon is, is the DBS, just because, you know, it, it was as if the semi-implicit but not explicit relationship to pocket watch design language and the, and the, the DB1 and its, uh, and its relatives, you know, kind of like, it, it, it kind of went into a phone booth and changed into its Superman uniform, you know, so to speak. I mean, it was a wildly different watch. I thought really, really successful as, as a design effort and extremely interesting technically. And um, there was, I mean, in the same way that there's kind of like, you know, there's an obvious relationship between Clark Kent and Superman, you know, I mean, you take it's off the glasses, the glasses and put on a cape and, yeah. you know. Um, uh, it really felt to me, uh, it feels now, and it, it certainly felt back then as if, um, you know, the company had kind of had a stroke come into its own in terms of design language. I mean, it was a very complete, expression of a very new philosophy of watchmaking and watch design. And I mean, nobody had ever seen anything like it before. Um, I don't think anybody's ever seen anything like it really since, except you know for variations on the design that have been produced by David Thin itself. And um, it both was a dramatic, dramatic change in direction and uh, I think a dramatic expression of new possibilities for David Thun. You know, it was like some watches are kind of continued expressions of philosophies, and some watches are, are really, you know, manifestos. And I think the DBS was really a manifesto. Without a doubt, it was also probably a more fitting package for the movement that they developed in 2004. Twin barrels, six days of power reserve, torque to drive complications. Uh, yeah. We went first into the DB15, which was a perpetual calendar moon phase. And in the DBS right. case, it really came into its own, the outside and the inside of the watch uh, sort of matching more symmetrically in ambition. Yeah, I mean, um, the DB15 was and is a beautiful watch, 
you know, again, this is hindsight is 2020. It feels like a, a little bit of a transitional effort, but only in retrospect. I mean, I think if you take it, you know, in itself as a design effort, it's a it's a it's a very very successful watch and a very beautiful one. And uh, I believe the first uh, instance of the use of the spherical moon phase, no? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and the interesting thing there is that we had a lot of change in a very short period, going from 2002 in the right. initial designs right. through 2006, when by this point we have the DB Digital, which looks like a tombstone, but I love it all the same, and the DB20 series, which was the beginning of automatic winding and water-resistant sports watches. Yeah. And so yeah. now we had everything from uh, six-day power reserves with shock-resistant winding systems to watches that allowed you to change the winding efficiency. We had power reserves. We had GMT. But there was also a realization almost immediately thereafter that there needed to be two types of debitun, the avant-garde and then the more accessible for folks who were coming from the likes of the Jorns and the Voudelainens and the then still nascent Moser. A round case, a solid dial, that was the DB25 of 2007, whereas the DB20 series of 2006 was just wild off the wall. There was an understanding that you still needed a point of entry. Yeah, and I mean, um, I mean those watches functioned as a as a point of entry, certainly in terms of uh, in terms of price and and in terms of taste, but they still felt very much connected to the rest of De Bethune's production. I mean, certainly in terms of uh, color scheme, general quality of execution, and yeah, I mean uh, the te technical features in the movement they were not as overtly visible as they were in some of the other watches, you know, the, some of the descendants of the uh, DBS series, for instance. But uh, you know, at the same time, um, simpler but not simplistic and still technically distinctive? I think that's a good way to put it. There are some brands where you know, you've know you got the haute de gamme and then you've got watches like Divit will make super high-end watches, then it'll also have a couple that are available with ETA movements just to pay the bills. Whereas right. with Debitun, the DB25 was not a junior Debitun, it was just a more conventional one. And it kind of opened the floodgates to the wild experimentation that came with the dream watches and the DB26 and later on. Yeah, I mean, I think that the whole philosophy of having a, I mean, it always looked to me as if, uh, you know, David Thune, when they decided to do a quote-unquote sports watch, a quote-unquote more, more wearable watch, they didn't necessarily want to do anything any less extroverted in terms of design language. Um, but, you know, sure, there are constraints of practicality that you have to address if you're going to make a watch that's, you know, designed to be relatively rugged and designed to be worn on a daily basis. And, um, you know, having a highly complex articulated lug system, quoting pocket watch design, you know, overtly with the crown at 12 o'clock. I mean, um, the, the floating lug system is absolutely fantastic. It's a beautiful, beautiful system. It's not necessarily consistent with a watch you would want to wear cleaning out the gutters on the weekends. Um, but the uh, the sports, the quote-unquote sports watches from David Thune, I don't think are any less interesting than some of the more complex case constructions and some of the more technically complicated watches. It's just a different expression of the same basic design philosophy and the same basic orientation towards watchmaking. And it's interesting because we do see the change happening so fast. In 2005, we've got the DBS. 2006, we've got the DB27. We've got the 25 as the anchor, the basic watch in the collection. Yeah, yeah. And then in 2008, we get the DB26 Perpetual Calendar, which in hindsight was the watch that defined the look of the brand. The floating lugs acting as the frame for whatever complications or innovations Denny wanted to package in. And I really do think there's this period in the late 2000s and early 2010s when the brand hits its commercial stride. But it's also important to just sort of take a step back and look at some of the innovations. Because whereas F.P. Journe often builds an entire watch around an innovation, the Chronomet Optimum, the Tourbillon Remontoir, the Chronomet Resonance, uh, Debitun would pack as many innovations as possible into a case. Like you mentioned, the DB15, not just their first in-house caliber, but also their first perpetual calendar, also their first spherical moon face. Right, right. We would see many different balance designs, and there was one reason for that, it's just function. Yeah, and you know, I always wonder whether or not, if David Thune had a problem, if they had a, um, a sort of challenge in how they presented themselves to the, the collector public, the watch enthusiast public, it's that there was so much there, you know? I mean, it was like going to a restaurant every night, and uh, the restaurant always had an absolute top quality expression of whatever cuisine it happened to be serving, but you didn't know going into the restaurant whether you were going to get like really, really high end uh, omakase or, um, you know, the best uh, expression possible of 1960s era French Nouvelle cuisine. You know, you were, you were definitely getting the best of something, but you, it required an, a readjustment uh, and a recalibration of your expectations almost every time you saw a new watch from De Bethune. And part of the attraction, I mean, to me, part of the attraction that I had to the company then and now 
is just the degree of restless technical innovation around chronometry specifically. I, I've lost track of the number of different balance and balance spring combinations that David Thune has tried, for example. And the interesting thing about, uh, I mean, let's, let's talk about the balances yes. you know, um, specifically for, you know, for just a moment. I mean, they're all extremely interesting. The design of each one of them is motivated by an attempt to improve certain basic aspects of the physics of um, a circular oscillator, but they're also really just beautiful to look at. Yes, you know. there's almost an organic quality in particular to the the yoke-shaped balance that they came out with. It was a combination of titanium and then bulb-shaped platinum. And by my count, they have at least 10 distinct balance designs. And the reason for this yeah. is that Denis is a scientist first and a third-generation watchmaker second. And so he's created his own little forge. He works with materials. He creates them from scratch. And then he incorporates them at the micro level, sometimes working through two or even three balance designs without the company even communicating that this change has been made. If this were Swatch Group, there'd be an entire marketing campaign built around a new balance design, and it would last for years. Right, right. So we have this restless innovation in the technical side of watchmaking, restless innovation in the design aspects of watchmaking at De Bethune. And, you know, most of their competitors were striving for a certain, I think, stability in how consumers perceived them. It was almost as if De Bethune really set out to uh, turn everybody's expectations on their heads uh, every time they released a new watch. You know, so there was no... I was going to say there was no sense that there was a kind of stable, consistent design language at David Thune, but that's not actually true. It's just it expressed itself in such dramatically different ways with every new generation of watch. But there are, there are certain consistencies. You know, I mean, the biggest one that I can think of is the consistent use of uh, blue yes. um, and white polished metal as contrasting elements. Uh, the De Bethune decorative stripes is another example. Um, the parachute shock, uh, anti-shock system, both as a design element and, and as a technical element is another consistent part of, uh, of, of watchmaking at De Bethune. So there is definitely a design through line, specifically in a technical through line, through all the De Bethune watches. I'm th I think probably clearer from uh, 2005 onwards, you know, post, post DBS. I agree with that. And I'd also say that realistically, a lot of the elements were already in place before the 2010 launch, the DB28, yeah. but maybe it was just the combination of all these things. It was the dial side barrel bridges and escapement and triple parachute shock protection, the moon phase, the floating lugs, uh, the colors, blue and polished titanium, all these things worked out from 2002 to 2010, coming together in the DB28, which ultimately became their most iconic piece. It is the face of the brand. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I mean, one of the things that I have always loved about De Bethune is, uh, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a problem in terms of having a kind of consistent uh, awareness of the identity of the company, of the, of the philosophy of the company. But uh, nonetheless, the fact that they have experimented as much as they have and the fact that they have tried so many different things and and stuck with the things that they have innovated with I think is really really impressive you know I mean the um, the, the period probably 2005 especially through right through the end of the financial crisis there was so much experimentation just across the board in uh, in fine watch making especially with uh, new ways to implement high complications, new technical solutions. You know, we saw Cartier launch its fine watchmaking collection. And I mean, I love that stuff. It was fun to write about. It was obviously not, in retrospect, it wasn't exactly what the larger uh, Cartier audience wanted from Cartier, but it was really, really impressive stuff. But when a company does something like that, <clears throat> what you really hope is that they're going to stick to their guns. You know, they're going to they're, they're demonstrate faith in their own uh, philosophy and their own, and their own products. Yes. And um, I always got the impression with De Bethune that they had a 110% commitment to the path that they had chosen and that they would rather not make watches at all than make watches that didn't represent to them a further expression of this highly idiosyncratic expression of watchmaking. And I think one of the places that you find the most um, characteristic expression of that philosophy is in the dream watches. Mm -hmm.